lecture series in honor and memory of Metropolitan Theodosius. If you don't know, was attached to our Paris in retirement. You know, now that we're coming out of COVID and everything, we can finally gather again. I've been trying to find ways to, to help us Orthodox Christians, not just our parish, but of course the whole community, uh, engage topics a little more. And uh, you know, my people, God, God bless them, have to put up with a lot of my talking. I don't ever stop talking. So I figured a great way to do this and to help them out would be to have guest speakers come in, uh, talking on topics that I'm not an expert on, right? And um, so this, we're, we're blessed to have Father John Chacos just from up about 19 for our inaugural lecture. Next month, we're gonna have Father Paul Abernathy come to talk about, not about the Neighborhood Resilience Project, the Resilience Project as such, but rather about the Orthodox Church as a hospital for those who suffer trauma. You know, a way that the Orthodox Church and her practices can help people who've suffered all manner of trauma to, to move forward and to be healed despite their brokenheartedness. Remember, we're blessed to have some um, OCMC missionaries to a family of OCM, uh, the McDonald family. They're actually on the poster, if you go up there, to Albania, speaking about the missionary efforts in, in Albania, which if you don't know, Albania, due to communism, was almost, the church there was almost entirely wiped out. Despite the fact that about a third of the, or of the population of Albania is historically Orthodox, there was not a single bishop left. They had killed every single bishop. They had torn down one of the churches. And ever since the fall of communism in 1991, the, there's been a huge push to, to reestablish the church there. And it's been a real blessing, and we're going to have the McDonald talk about that. And then in October, we're tentatively having a, a friend of mine come to speak um, about the Orthodox Church and how we ought to respond to those suffering with various LGBTQ issues. So that'll be in October, and so far that's the end of our of our <laughs> of our of our upcoming speakers. We're hoping to get to this every month. So any ideas you might have for speakers or topics you'd like us to consider, we of course can reach out to those who might be able to address them. And um, you know, we do ask at the end. I'll take a, a collection of sorts. Um, our hope is is that and we as we do this, and we have local speakers uh, over time, we'll be able to build up a nice fund of money in order to bring speakers from further afield, right? Some speakers might have to fly here, that's gonna cost money, um, including, I actually have uh, spoken to the abbot of the Sokodecheni Monastery in Kosovo about the Orthodox Church in Kosovo and nationalism and orthodoxy. He's happy to come here, but that would cost some money. We probably have to get the uh, other Serbian churches or what have you to give them a speaking circuit, but things like that are what your money would go to if we uh, were able to raise money is bringing speakers from farther afield, both in this country and even from abroad. Matryoshka, um, are we ready for, okay. Well, without further ado, I thank you so much for being here, Father John. We'll stand and say, O Heavenly King, together, and um, <coughs> then we'll let Father John stand. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, whatever we are present, and fill us all things, pray for your blessings and give our life. Come and lie in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls of your one. Thank God. Thank you, Father John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you tonight. And I understand that it's uh, in honor, in memory of Metropolitan uh, Theodosius. When I was upstairs in the church, I noticed he had the icon of St. Herman with a, and it so happened that when I was visiting uh, Kodiak, Alaska, we uh, were there with Metropolitan Theodosius for a meeting of the mission board, OCMC. And uh, we were on a plane together, and uh, he came up to me and he said, here, I want you to take this relic, and I want you to give it the Holy Cross. That was where I was serving at that time. So we have an icon of St. Herman, a big one, the relic also. So as soon as that song starts, it's a bit remember. So we made that connection, and we never forgotten that. It was a beautiful, beautiful trip. But anyway, tonight our topic is uh, Guatemala, what's happening there, the church. Uh, I'm going to start just to give you a brief background to Guatemala with the group that I'm working with, the Mayan people, uh, really began 10 years ago in March. Now we're going into the 11th year. Uh, this was a group of people that were led by a very charismatic priest who had been a Roman Catholic, Father Andres, on, uh, became well known in Guatemala as a figure who was advocating for the rights 
of the Mayan people because in Guatemala, the Mayan people were more or less kind of like, so they needed land, they needed places to, uh, you know, uh, settle where they could have some uh, opportunities for themselves. Uh, but in order for this to happen, the, all of the people that owned the land, a lot of the rich landowners had to be kind of like pressured to do something, as well as those in the government. So Father Giron uh, began to pressure them, himself not being Mayan, uh, he had the connections with the uh, people that were of a more of a Hispanic uh, background. They were called Ladinos. A Ladino is someone who is from European ancestry, maybe mixed with some uh, with some Mayan background. But anyway, he became a very well-known figure in the government. He actually was even in there, uh, he was a senator, even as a priest. But because of his political activities, he was uh, expelled from the Catholic Church. And uh, for a while, he had kind of like an independent, uh, you know, kind of independent, uh, canonically received in the Orthodox Church. Thereby began a process of visiting and bringing them in. And so now we have maybe about 106. Not all of them are big. It could be a cluster of 20 families in the village. But the thing is, there are 20 families in the village. It could be 200 people. And there are a lot of children. And there you go. It's a very prolific, the Mayan people are very prolific, you know. So the women get very, very young, 15, 16, 17. And uh, so you see a lot of babies when you go to church. <laughs> They're pretty well behaved though, considering. <laughs> so anyway, this takes us back to the history of Guatemala. Before the coming of the con conquistadores, you know who they are, right? Before they conquered Guatemala and Mexico, and in those regions, the Mayan people worshiped in these temples. And um, they believed that the souls of the dead would be down below here. And many times they had sacrificial altars. Now, they practiced sacrifice, human sacrifice. I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie Apocalypto. It's a really violent movie. But what they would do was they would take the victims, put them on the altar, hold them down, and then they would cut out their hearts. So they were like live sacrifices there. And uh, that was the way that they, you know, that was their worship. As you know, that's very ancient in many cultures. Human sacrifice was not unknown. Uh, so uh, so that was the kind of the background before the, uh, the Spanish came. But at least you know a little bit about it. You see a lot of these temples there today. Now they're more, today they're used mainly as tourist centers. So you can go and visit some of the uh, shrines that they have. Okay, let's take a look. This is Guatemala. It's about the size of the state of Ohio. Uh, it's a country that has a lot of variety to it. There are a lot of uh, volcanoes, mountains, uh, they have a big area in the Pacific Ocean where there's a lot of uh, sea coasts there, and a very small area over here in the Caribbean. The country has a population of about 17 million people. So considering, even though it's about the size of Ohio, it's got a fairly decent sized population, and it's growing, it keeps growing all the time. There are a lot of problems there. You've seen a lot about the news about uh, Guatemala, Honduras, so there's a lot of poverty there. Uh, people are desperate in some cases. In the big cities where a lot of Guatemalans are forced to live in order to try to make a living, uh, it's really very dangerous. You know, there's a lot of drug dealing, drug cartels. But in the areas that these people that I work with come from, there's none of that going on. It's actually very safe. They're in the rural areas, up in the mountains. They were refugees, many of them, from the Civil War. There was a Civil War from 1960 to 1996, and it was the government versus the Mayan people. And uh, the, the Mayan people, who were the so-called insurgents, uh, who wanted land reform, who wanted to be, uh, you know, have some share of the wealth of Guatemala, because Guatemala's wealth, 71% uh, of the land is owned by one or two percent of the people. So very little of the you know, the wealth is shared among the lesser people.
people that are uh, background of the Mayan background. So it's really a difficult thing. So the government then was forced through Father A. Huron's effort to uh, give land to help the people, you know, to a certain degree. Um, so, but that war was really bad. About a quarter of a million Mayan people were murdered. It was like a genocide. So you have, there's a lot of background. I spoke with a lot of families who had relatives who were killed during the Civil War. Okay, now before we press this to get started, we go and we visit these communities. They're all over in the mountains, the most unlikely places. You can travel up in the hills, around and around and around with a vehicle on dirt roads with drops of 2,000 you know, feet. And you're thinking to yourself, what am I going to find up here? Could anyone live up here? And uh, we arrive in these places, and the Guatemalans get so excited. Whenever a priest, or especially a bishop comes, for them it's like the second coming of Christ. And they receive you with such joy and, and gratitude. And uh, I'll see if we want to play this music. <laughs> Civil War, they had to leave their, their their native areas and go into the mountains and kind of find a way to survive there. And again, they didn't have a, a church, you know, a clergy visiting them on a very regular basis. Many times they've been, been you know, the Catholic Church, which was their, their mother church at one time, uh, the priests weren't going into the villages and they weren't really identifying very much with their the clergy because most of them were Europeans. They weren't Guatemalans. And so, you know, they would they were kind of like a little abusive at times to the people and uh, they loved Father Andres. I mean he was this uh, charismatic person, the way he spoke. He, he even would tell them whenever he would go to speak, he said, I wish I was born by him. He was so uh, much identified with him. They really related to him very well. And that's why this whole movement now of many tens of thousands of people began to follow. You go to the next slide, and uh, this one right here. This is Father Andres. He passed away in 2014. I was with him when he died, 2014. Uh, and that's Archbishop of Inagoras. And this was the first visit where he was received, his group was being received into the church, a sign of unity that they were coming together. Uh, and that's how it all began. And we began doing different projects with the people there through OCMC and um, uh, with the indigenous clergy that they had. Okay, now here's an example of uh, one of our indigenous priests. Father, uh, his name in the Spanish is Diego, but when he became an Orthodox priest, he took, we gave him a Greek name, Evangelos. So he is now Father Evangelos, uh, Padre Evangelos, and I'm Padre Juan, so when I go to Guatemala. <laughs> so we've been, uh, you know, talking to him about different customs of the Orthodox Church, and they really like the one with the eggs, <laughs> the guy the eggs. And uh, we had uh, wonderful celebrations with them. And, uh, you know, like uh, Saturday of Lazarus, uh, you know, we would go, uh, at Paul Sunday, we would go and do a big procession 
with the palm crosses and palm branches they would have there. And we'd go through the whole village, this one village. There were thousands of uh, Orthodox who were there. Next one, please. Okay, now here's an example. We went to a village, and here we met with some of the catechists. The way they dress, see that? They dress like that every day. And they're from a certain region of Guatemala. It's called Todos Los Santos, All Saints. It's a whole region. It's like a state unto itself. And uh, so uh, the Archbishop from Andres, myself, uh, Jesse Brando, one of our missionaries, who's still there, and uh, another priest, we met with them. And now uh, we've been training them now, the Orthodox faith, doctrines, uh, liturgical practices, and so forth. So that was the first official visit in 2012. Very humble village of San kids some things on the iPad. They got all excited. They ran and called their mothers. They were all looking. They went to see. You know. So it was funny. But anyway, that's just this particular village. Now these people, they, you know, every time we see them, you know, it's sort of like long lost relatives whenever I go there. Okay, next one, please. This is, we started a seminary of St. Andrews, San Andres, uh, a few years ago. We don't have that many students. 
Uh, we have about uh, maybe 10 students. One of them is studying in Greece. The others come to classes uh, in the villas where we have uh, a, a place for them to stay. And uh, you know, we bought books for them in Spanish. Uh, we have a missionary there now on site. He and his wife are living at the seminary. I go when I can, and when I can't go, I teach classes by Skype to the students. And we have uh, others as well. A father juvenile, who is uh, also teaching at the seminary, and uh, also uh, Jesse Brando, one of our missionaries. So whenever we can, we can't. If we can't go there in person, we just do it by Skype, and they send it out. So you can see the books they're getting. We're getting them uh, a number of things translated into Spanish, and we get other books and we translate them for them. We're able to do that, and uh, we have them perfect the Spanish. But we're, we've been able to produce some things that is helping them quite a bit. And then these boys also, they do a lot of field work. They go out with the priests into the villages, and they're kind of like the choir, because the people don't know. You go somewhere, you travel for hours. <coughs> Hundreds of people are waiting to see you. It's so busy, you need help. You need hands to help you. I, they sent me to one of these villages uh, by myself, and I was gone for a weekend. I had to do 50 baptisms, 20 weddings, confessions, chrismations, and this is just over the course of a weekend. This is like a normal day the priest travels from village to village to village. Go to the next one, please. Okay, now, a few years ago, we realized that in order for the Orthodox Church to really be effective, it wasn't just about preaching, not just about sharing with them the faith, in paramount for all of us to know the faith, but also, we needed to be able to help them with their bodily needs, especially medical situations, and there were so many. Because in the areas that we work in Guatemala, in these rural areas, there are no doctors. Might be some nurses here and there, and it's hard to get medicine if they, if they even can afford it. If somebody gets real sick, they usually are gonna die, or uh, if they can get to a hospital, they wouldn't be able to afford it anyway if it was, a, you know, unless it was a, one of the country's uh, public hospitals. So uh, we built a medical clinic that was uh, dedicated in memory of Father Andres, and um, we began treating people, and now we have teams of doctors that go down there. Uh, we have a team going on in November. Uh, we've got Pittsburgh teams go. Uh, we have people from all over the country through OCMC, and uh, we take medicines down, medical equipment, uh, and in the meantime, I visited with one of the Guatemalan priests two different universities. One was a medical school, the other was a dental school in different parts of Guatemala. And we have an arrangement now where they have interns that come and they live at our clinic for a period of time, maybe six months to a year, and they treat the people. So we have medical services being provided now over the last six years uh, to people that are you know, in, in need of help. So that's an ongoing thing. But then the doctors come from the States and uh, they bring their own specialties as well. And we try to bring medicines with us. We buy medicines. So this is a very active ministry. But uh, stories here are very interesting. Each one is a different story. Here was a woman right here, 60 years old. She had this condition like a fungus. We had never seen anything like this. It was like, you know, People were, even the doctors that were on the medical team were aghast, and they said, you have to see this. And she told us that she had fallen 16 years ago, and, and then this fungus grew on her leg, and she was limping, and she couldn't walk her. She walked for a long distance to get to the clinic when she heard there were doctors. And uh, she came limping along, and she got to the clinic, and we took a picture of it. We didn't know how to treat it. We'd never seen it before. We sent this photograph to St. Clair Hospital where there was a dermatologist. And he thought it was a fungus. And he said, there's a treatment for it. There's a particular antiseptic cream that you can use, antibiotic cream. So we happened to have it in the clinic. And uh, we, the woman had already left, so we had to run after her trying to catch her. So uh, we finally caught up with her the next day. And we showed her how to wash her leg three times a day and put this antibiotic uh, cream on the leg, and you know, her leg is clean today. 
within a month to clear it out. After 16 years walking around like that, you can imagine, just a little thing like that. Now the other case is a 12 year old girl. She also had this growth that was on her face and on her chest. And uh, she came from a long distance from a distant village and uh, the same, same type of situation. So we get these kinds of cases all the time. Things that we can take care of very easily here, there they have no way of getting these medicines or even knowing how to deal with them. And you know, if someone wants to see a doctor, well, that's a term, you know, you just they can't afford it. So we were many times, we were the first medical teams that they had ever seen. So we go to the next one. We also did a dental outreach program. That's a big thing in Guatemala. The kids, their teeth are really bad. When they're babies, the parents give them this kind of like a sugary drink with a bottle. And the teeth up here get rotted out in little spikes just from that. And then just the dental care in general is not that great. So we started an outreach with a uh, little packets, only a quarter, and you put in this uh, uh, into a, a thing of water, you a certain amount of water, and you put this packet, it's like a powder, a fluoride, fluoride powder. And then you have the kids once a week gargle and then spit it out. So we took it to the local school that had 500 children, the elementary school. And we have one day the, the person comes from the clinic, they gargle and they spit it out, and now the teeth are beginning to get a lot better. And some of these interns who are coming from the Guatemala universities, also they go out and they visit the schools in the area, and now they even have kids coming to get their teeth cleaned. We'll go to the next one, please. Uh, recently, uh, we had a, 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 an eye clinic. A lot of these people couldn't see very well because they're working in the sun, you know, it affects your eyes, they didn't have glasses. So we bought, we got hundreds of pairs donated glasses that have been uh, checked out. I carried with me in a real big suitcase and not a refract refractor. It's for check your eyes. You know when you go to see the, the doctor at the, uh, for your eyes, you look at the machine. I was carrying one of those machines uh, and I had to get it through custom. <laughs> not, not forgive me, but I had to lie. <laughs> it was. Yes. It's better to lie and get it through than not be able to help these people. So, <laughs> so they, uh, let, they let it go through. But normally they open everything up and they look and they, well, what's this? And, you know, and they, they give you like a, you have to pay like a, uh, like a fee or like a duty, you know, whatever it is. Depending. And they saw all these glasses. We had a suitcase filled with eye and readers. We bought at very low price. And they were going to charge us for each one of them. It was going to add up to a lot of money. So the woman that was with us just started crying, crying, please, for the poor people. So finally, the uh, the person with the customs had felt, you know, felt, uh, you know, some pity for us, and she let this go through without having to pay. <laughs> but things, what things we have to do? If I were to tell you some of the things that I imported from Mexico, the U.S. groups are uh, computer reach. You know, we took computers down that were donated for the seminary and for the school. So just think about it. these women. See how old they are? It's kind of like in each family, it's like a tradition. If you're a midwife, you train your daughter so that she can take over and she goes with you, and then and, and on it goes down the generations. Now, let's say there's a problem with pregnancy. This is a big deal in Guatemala. Let's say the baby's breech or there's some other issue going on, and maybe that's something that they're not able to deal with. The, the people in the villages sometimes can't even afford the bus fare to go a few hours away to a hospital, and some of them die, you know, in childbirth. They don't make it to the hospital, either because they can't afford the, the fare or, you know, it's just too long by the time they get, they get there. So this is a big problem with uh, uh, deliveries. And as I said, the rates of pregnancy, you know, in that village are very high. Next, please. Now, another thing, talking of babies, we do a lot of baptisms, a lot of baptisms. Wherever we go, it could be... 50, 20, 25, even as many as 50 baptisms in one city, one time. So myself, when I'm there, I'm of course, uh, I try to help out where I can. We each have a different function. One does the clipping of the hair, another one does the cremation. Uh, so we just have like a, sort of like a, uh, you know, 
And here is a gathering of the catechists. These are the fellows in the uh, trenches. In every village you have two, three, four, maybe five catechists. And their job is to organize the worship in the community. You have to keep in mind that they're not going to see a priest very often. So the people come together, they pray together, they take care of each other, and uh, they kind of like maintain a spiritual life, you know, apart from the, from the presence of the clergy. And, uh, you know, I've met some remarkable people. The one person in particular that I met more recently, and I interviewed her, her name is Germana Maria, Sister Maria. She's an elderly Mayan woman, very holy. She would be like, one of our saints. From a very young age, she never wanted to get married, but her, she was 14 and her parents forced, forced her to get married. So she got married, she had a couple of kids, and but she was very spiritual, and she was kind of like a visionary. And she would she would have these uh, way of you know understanding the threats against the village. She could in you know in her prayers, she could see things that were going wrong that needed to be prayed over. She could, uh, she would have people come and talk to, to them about their problems, and she would counsel them. And uh, she got a group of the women together in the village, and they would meet on a regular basis, and they would pray together. So this woman, just unbelievable, I wish I had a picture to show you, but she's, you know, very ascetical. She lives on her own. She raises her own garden. She doesn't have electricity. She lives in the dark. She prays, you know, in her house all day. She's just like, a, like by our tradition, the Orthodox Church, she would be in the center. That's the way she lives. And uh, and then there was another man. He was uh, his name is Ramon Camposecos. He's uh, in his 80s. This guy's unbelievable. He's been like a missionary to his own people for all of his adult life. He just travels all over the world, all in preaching the word of God. He became Orthodox, and uh, he's a, he's a catechist. So. These people that you see here, coming from all over Guatemala, they stay at our center where we're building a seminary, and um, we train them in the teaching of the Orthodox Church. Uh, we teach them, you know, how to do the sacraments, about communion. You know, they weren't used to the idea of taking communion on a spoon. This is like a big, you know, big issue for them. You know, like it was here with COVID. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it going to touch my, my time or whatever? So there, they were really worried about it, you know. It's funny because if you see everything, they all share drinks and everything there. There's the very little concern for, you know, hygiene, you know, in so many other areas. But all of a sudden, the communion was that. Whoa, I don't know. So we explain, just open your mouth and we'll just kind of drop it in there and try to break them into a little bit. So. But so we do teaching with them. Uh, we usually get about 100, 120, and they just sleep out on the ground, many of them. Because we don't have a dormitory, we sleep out overnight on the ground. We have a liturgy with them. We do, uh, you know, teachings with them. And they come from all over. They pay their own way for these catechetical gatherings. We have them once every two months. And they go back to their villages. And we give them a book. It's called the uh, Calendario Liturgico. It's like a liturgical calendar, Lives of the Saints. Uh, the hymns that go with that particular saint, the readings of the day, a little teaching about the feasts around that period of time. So every three months, our seminarians, with the help of our missionaries, produce this tri-monthly uh, outreach uh, that we give out to all the catechists. And they go back to their villages, and even when there's no priest, they can you know, do the proper readings, uh, honor the saints of the day, and so forth. So this gives you a little kind of overview of what's going on in Guatemala. Uh, I haven't been able to go during this past year because of COVID. Uh, it was very difficult. The border had been closed. I barely got out of the country uh, last year because they shut the borders down. And my wife and I had our three suitcases and we were we were stuck on the border and we had to get into the border of Mexico so we could get, get home again. And uh, so we got in the, this big chain across the border there and we had to talk to the uh, guards and let them know that we were Americans and we went to go home. So they lifted up the chain, we got through, we hired a, you know, a taxi, and we were able to get to where we needed to go. But it's been, it's, it hasn't, it's not spreading like other places yet, because these people live in rural areas. They're outdoors more than they are indoors, so they're not around, you know, it's not 
quite the same setup as it would be in maybe your living in tight quarters in, the, in our homes and so forth. So that's kind of the story of Guatemala, what we've been doing. OCMC has been a big supporter. We have, a, we have mission teams gone, and we've had a music team that goes down, and they teach them how to sing Orthodox hymns. We've had medical teams, we've had construction teams, uh, the sewing, of course, is another thing. Uh, dental teams have gone down. Uh, so we try to do a little bit of everything. Uh, the teaching teams, we do a vacation church program in some of the villages where American missionaries go down. They spend about 10 days and they work with the children in the villages, you know, so different things like that. So the church is growing there, it's growing very fast. Uh, it's uh, very well known now in Guatemala. And to our surprise, Patriarch Bartholomew has accepted the invitation to come to Guatemala in November. So he's coming to the United States for the blessing, uh, the door opening of St. Nicholas at Ground Zero. And he's gonna to go to Cuba. And then from Cuba, he's supposed to come to Guatemala and everything is okay, you know, with the COVID and everything like that. So that's our that's our story, Father. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. And I hope at least you have a little idea of your brothers and sisters in Guatemala. And uh, maybe you can pray for them as I, I know they're praying for you. so we can take uh, blood pressure. Uh, so diabetes is a big problem there with the people, the highest sugar from their diet, sugar cane, because that's one of the main exports of our oil. Coffee, sugar cane are two of the big uh, uh, exports that they have here. And of course, fruit and so forth. A lot of our food comes from our oil. Father? How much did it cost? Uh, the cost? It was uh, with everything we, you know, the fundraising, eighty-three thousand dollars. So that's everything: altar screen, icons, you know, all the cement, all the bricks, you know, everything, the roofing, and it's eighty-three thousand dollars. That church in the United States is a million dollars. A million dollars. They did all the work themselves. You know, they were just—they know how to build their own way. They have their own way of doing things. So we just here's the plan. Here are the materials, and they figured it out. They're very resourceful, yeah. Father, what, when you said some of, when you would go to like that very first church, they were very receptive. Uh -huh. What do you think it was that they knew or heard about what Orthodox people were? Uh -huh. What was it that drew them it to was even that be reason. so receptive? Just, was, just because of the first the Father Christian. address. Okay, and so he... You should have seen this guy when he was preaching. I mean, you could feel his love for the people. And he was just, like I said, very dynamic. He had a way with the Mayan people. He was like their father. He was like their Moses, put it that way. Because here's a man that's helping them not only religiously, you know, and spiritually, but also he's helping them get land, you know. And uh, whenever we would be together, he would have every day visitors coming from all over. Uh, I stayed with him for a while. And you know, he also had to get the healing. Another thing, he would pray over people, I witness some miracles of things that he was able to do with people with exorcisms, uh, people with uh, other issues. And if someone had a need for a legal help for a piece of land that they were trying to clear, uh, maybe the owner or the, the, the landowners 
when you come by and say, okay, look, we're gonna take this land, we're gonna give you this amount of money, you don't, we're, we don't, you don't have, you don't have a deed for it. So father would go and get a lawyer, pay the lawyer, and they would get a, the land legally registered so that this couldn't be done to them. So things like that. So that the work gets done. People, Interesting. Yeah. 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 Have any of the seminarians been ordained, or what's the future of them? We have a couple right now that will be ordained when the patriarch comes. Yeah. And originally, we ordained. Uh, ordained eight priests who were part of their movement. Unfortunately, Father Andres passed away in 2014. Another younger priest, only 42, diabetes, he passed away. I told you diabetes is like a scourge, you know, among the money. They have to really be careful with their health. They don't have, you know, the better medicines. But they, you know, we brought the A1C machine and we check their blood and make sure, you know, and we're helping now, we're getting people medicine so that they can be on medicines, they can take what they need if they're a diabetic. You know, if they're, if they're type two diabetics, for example, you know, we're able to help them out. But that's, uh, that's what drew them is the fact that this priest, he came and they trusted him, they loved him, and he was the one that literally delivered these people to Orthodox. So our job now is to really you know, to bring them beyond just being catechumens to, to becoming, you know, another to, to understand you. They have belief. They love Christ. Now that's not the issue. They know the Bible very well. But it's the faith of all the tradition, the doctrines, and so forth. That part is what we're doing. Yeah. Yes, right in the back. Um, the priests that you mentioned that are native that go basically yeah. on circuit, how are their basic needs met? If they're, they're oh, that's a good question, yeah. Right? They have no no real medical benefits. What happened with Father Andres was able to um, build three gas stations in one part of Guatemala. One of them was named after Fort Tocos. <laughs> Another one was named after, uh, you know, uh, different saints' names. And so if you want to get gas, you go to the Tocos gas station. <laughs> so we used some of that money to help cover some of their expenses help them buy cars. And when they go to a village, they take up a collection. But it's very little, maybe enough to pay for the gas in your car. And then uh, now that we've gotten involved, we're trying to help out in uh, getting, uh, finding different kind of uh, ways of helping them raise their own money, take care of themselves. We're looking to buy, start a cattle farm, the sewing center we talked about already. Um, things like that. We're, to find ways to help them to, I mean, we can give them a loan from Mission OCMC. If they have a project, we can give them a loan, and then they have to pay the loan back, but they can start a business that will support their communities. Yes? Did, did he die in Guatemala? Yeah. And how, how do they view that? Like It's so natural, it's so like, it's so common. It's not like it is here. Death there is, Die. It's just it's so natural. You said so and so died, everyone knows. And what they do is when somebody dies, the whole village goes to the home. They lay the person out in the home. They pray all night with the family, everybody in the village. And then in the morning, they go to the cemetery. Death is very much a part of life here because of just you know the way it's treated here. It's a lot different. I feel like with foreign missions versus like hometown missions, uh -huh. there's often, I don't know what the, precisely what it is, but it's like a different mindset. Is there anything that you've learned from your time in Guatemala that could be applied to American missions? To what we're doing here in the States? Yes. Recognizing the fact that you know, every culture has its own idiosyncrasies. You know, it's not right for us to take the Orthodox Church as we experience it here whether it's a Greek or Russian or Arabic or whatever, and hope to make that be the way that you have to respect what they do, what they do. So during the wedding ceremonies, they have customs there that we accept. You know, at the end of the service, the husband takes some coins out of his hand and he puts it in his wife's hands, and at the end of the service he says, from now on, I'm basically I'm just summarizing. I'm giving you this to let you know that I'm gonna take care of you. And then they have the custom of, uh, 
a lasso. They put them around them, you know, so, and they're kind of tied together. Uh, we introduced the crowns. They didn't have the crowns. We introduced that as part of the ceremony. So there's little things like that that they do. And during communion, for example, communion time, we have the regular communion hymns, but they also have their own music. So the band starts to play. And they play their music. It's very lively. They're very they get very excited. So we accept that. And that's their culture. We can't go down there and tell them this is what you've got to do, and that's it. As long as they're not doing anything that's taking away, but we want them to we want the faith to be incarnated in the way that they are experiencing it. You know, if we go to places in the United States that are different than our typical Orthodox culture, we know that we're gonna to have to make some uh, changes, you know, in some areas we're gonna make you know, nothing about trying, but it's going to be the way people pray and worship and how they, how they experience the faith. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was going to ask a similar question. Like, um, in, in the videos, it looked like um, there was this one instance where the priest was like waving a censer. And, yeah, um, that was Father Andreas, yeah. He, they were singing um, with like a hymn, but it was yeah. in a tone very different to right. how right. they exactly. were yeah. singing. Right. Um, how does the liturgy of, do they celebrate the liturgy of Chrysostom? Yeah, there? yeah. If it is, how do they um, kind of work the traditional tones in with the tones that have developed uh, naturally there? Yeah. Uh, they, they have, uh, they kind of, right now we've been kind of combination of uh, uh, Byzantine, uh, Russian style, you know, because there are seminarians, they're helping us down there, that's all they know. So they've been learning how to chant. We even have somebody from Pittsburgh teaching them how to chant. Uh, I don't know if uh, she had the class online and she was able to go down and she also had been teaching them via Skype how to sing some of the hymns of the church. But they have their own, you know, some of their own hymns and melodies and the tones that we follow. They're learning little by little. But, you know, if they have a way of, unique way of singing, they do have a unique way of singing in their native language. It's a lot different, but it's going to take a lot of work. You'd have to get uh, what they one of those uh, musicologists who could take their music and adapt it to our Byzantine or our Orthodox way of worshiping. But it would take somebody that really is able to do that. You know, and these are very humble people. They're you know just basically a peasants. You know. Yes. Has this like mission work? Is there been any pushback from the? Native Catholic Church or the indigenous religion as well? No, okay. no we're pretty, uh, this group, these people that we're dealing with were, were turned on to their Christian faith a lot by the charismatic movement, which was started here at Duquesne University and Notre Dame. So that swept through uh, South America and also the evangelical Christian. Uh, Guatemala in 1970 was 90% Catholic. Now it's less than 50%. All over Latin America, thousands of people every day are leaving the Catholic Church because of the missionaries that are coming in. There are a lot of Mormons, Seventh day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, evangelical groups, Pentecostals are coming in, and uh, they're you know, changing the whole culture in so many different ways. So here we come along, we're more of a traditional or traditional church, for sure, but we're trying to be, being that we have the indigenous priests, they can go and they can relate to their people. <clears throat> you know, for me to go down, it's one thing, you know. Yes, I speak Spanish, but I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not white. I can't identify with their culture the way that one of their own priests would be able to, and be able to relate to them. So that's why our church is had making gains because uh, we're reaching them at the level that, you know, and we're going out. We don't stay in the big cities. Our priests go out to these areas that are very hard to get to. That's where these, a lot of these people are. You know, Guatemala is, a, is, a, is a hard to get through. They're, oh, there's not that many, there are not many paved roads. The main highways, yes. But then when you get off the main drag, it's all dirt roads. And sometimes you have to walk to get to the places you need to go. schools there? Uh, yeah, but uh, they don't take the education so seriously. If they get to sixth grade, that would be lucky. Very few of the Mayan 
villages have a secondary school. Yeah, it's a problem. Education is a big problem. Yes, in the back? What language is the liturgy served in? Mainly in Spanish, because we haven't translated it into the local dialect where the world looking at. It's really hard to do that. Okay, we do have Bibles in the local dialect, but Spanish is becoming more, uh, more accepted as the general language for the church. It's way on the other side of the country. The orphanage is more on the uh, eastern side of the country. This area where a lot of the people are and where the villages are, are closer to the border with Mexico in that, in that general area. The clinic is only 20 minutes away from the border with Mexico. And we get, we also have a lot of Mexicans who are Orthodox now coming in from southern Mexico, Chiapas because they were refugees from the Civil War. They crossed the border, they settled in uh, southern Mexico, and they are also at many churches that we also minister to as well. And isn't Bishop Alejo the Orthodox Association? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Does he have uh, some of the similar missions? Uh, no, yeah, he's in another part of Mexico. He's not anywhere near where we are. I know he's in Mexico City. Does yeah. he have some efforts to help us a lot? Not where we are, maybe in Yucatan, but where do you stay when you go? I mean, do you sleep in a bed? And <laughs> Sometimes, not always. <laughs> 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 My wife is with me, we sleep in bed with so that. I don't take her to these villages. <laughs> but when I go, I, you know, wherever they have a place, you know, so with whatever it is, we sleep where we have to sleep, you know, yeah. or the church or whatever. You know. <laughs> but the people are so gracious. They're so welcoming, you know, the hospitality. Really quite a virtue. They're happy to see a priest. When are they going to see one? You know, I said they have a saying in Spanish from the bishop, like the bishop. You know, we have a saying in uh, English when something is very rare, a very rare occurrence, you say, once in a blue moon, right? You say that. Oh, once in a blue moon. How often does the bishop come? Oh, once in a blue moon. Well, in uh, Guatemala, whenever something is very, a very rare occurrence, they go, como la visita del obispo. Like the visit of the bishop. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Father, for, uh, for gracing us with this wonderful, inspirational story of our efforts there. And uh, hopefully, you can inspire us, maybe find ways to help locate us. Whenever, if anyone has uh, an interest sometime, to come down and uh, help out some. Uh, alguien habla español aquí en este grupo. Tenemos uh, personas que hablan un poquito de español. I am understood enough to say no. <laughs> <laughs> you sure understood though, right? <laughs> 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 Mary, uh, God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, I'll put those on the way out or something, but we have flyers for next month if you'd like to come back again. We're asking for Father Paul Abernathy. And please consider offering a little bit of money. We'll take that in, and over time, hopefully, be able to uh, to bring people from farther and field. Just real quick, if we want to like donate to any of the efforts, how would you ask us to do that? Uh, we have a fund at Holy Cross called the Holy Cross Mission Fund. And all the funds that are there go directly to the Guatemala Mission. It's an hundred percent. I've been Holy Cross. And I don't, I don't need funding because I'm retired and I have my own pension and social security. So whatever we do, we don't charge anything. So if somebody wants to, you know, donate to the clinic or to the seminary or whatever, we also have the mission walk every second Sunday in October. We have a mission walk in South Park or in other places where the parishes have. And the money's that are raised in that helps the Guatemala mission as well. The mission walk is a nice way for someone to go out. It's like a 7K walk. And uh, we're able to raise funds that way. But uh, yeah. the mission center has been very supportive. I'm also, like I said, I'm part of the OCMC as a mission specialist and also as a board member. So we have to keep that in mind, OCMC. Or you can just spend the money directly to OCMC and say, we're part of all. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much.